uh, into just thinking through some of these issues in a number of the contexts that I work in, and then I'm going to come back to, to Rajasthan. So recently, I have been working on a project um, in Nepal that was looking at the links between women work and violence. And we were working in a number of settings. We worked with a community of construction workers who have migrated to Kathmandu. So following the earthquake in 2014, there was obviously an acute need for construction work. It's interesting that, that, that the construction sector really has been opened up to, to women. In a country like Myanmar, that's not what you see. So again, it's interesting we have to understand the different contexts um, and what might be shaping those um, contexts in terms of the wider political and cultural um, economy. So in this research, we interviewed a number of construction, female construction workers. They're all low paid. They all experience on a daily basis high levels of harassment. So this picture that I deliberately um, chosen really kind of highlights this. So the job that women do in construction is to carry the bricks. Usually, a lot of the buildings are very um, tall, so they're going up and down stairs um, carrying bricks. Um, their male peers have jobs as masons, so they're actually sticking the bricks together. I'm not a builder, but that's essentially <laughs> it's more technical, seen as more technical, so they earn more money. But it's gendered. The women are not seen as having the um, correct attributes to be able to go on to become masons. So even projects, UNDP funded projects to offer women training to become masons, they go through the training, they prove there's no reason why they can't, obviously there's no reason why they can't do it, but they do not get jobs because site managers say that's not a job for women, it's a job for men. So we see that level um, of oppression and we see high levels of harassment, um, both in terms of getting to work, getting home, getting back from work, harassment actually at work, and then we see high levels of domestic violence um, at home also. So women in, this, in, our, in our research were suffering, most of them, multiple levels of violence. And to the point where not all of those forms of violence are necessarily would place in that category. So this normalisation comes into um, play. So we might interview a number of women who say, yes, my husband beats me in a game, but you know what, that's just what happens. Yes, you know, we do get harassed at work, but, you know, again, that's just, that's what men do. So digging into it a little bit more in terms of, well, what, what can we do to make any inroads into changing this? What comes out... Um, very clearly in my research in different contexts is the importance of local women's organisations, safe female um, peer networks, in this case social mobilisers who have a very specific role in supporting um, women within their community who they know are suffering from violence. And they have a really critical role in terms of challenging the normalisation but they also have a critical role in terms of then linking women to the right support um, services. I should say, in the case of the construction workers, again, that picture is bleak, but again, I can pull out numerous stories of women organising and expressing um, agency to actually challenge that situation. So the women, they had their strategies. They would not they would look out for each other. There was one instance when they weren't paid by a site manager. They just all went to his house and just shamed him into paying them. So it's, resistance is, is there, of course it's there, um, but so too is very high levels um, of, of violence and in all these different forms. Another study also in Nepal, we looked at the experiences of violence in the informal entertainment sector, which has grown uh, massively in Nepal due to sort of the, the growth of global sex trafficking routes um, and the impact of, of globalisation. Uh, generally, and they make for a really uh, interesting case study because the women that we interviewed who work in this sector have had even more extreme experiences of violence. So they've come from very rural settings, they were caught up in the Maoist conflict, a lot of them have been raped by the Maoist insurgents, they also suffered very extreme <coughs> domestic violence, a lot of them were 
basically child um, brides and suffered high levels of violence because of that. So they come into this sector, this informal entertainment sector, with all of that trauma. And what was really fascinating was the impact that they felt earning an income had for their um, lives. Even though in their work lives they're suffering still from constant um, violence, they felt that the opportunity to be able to earn sufficient income to look after themselves and to look after <coughs> their children liberated them, made them feel to a certain extent um, empowered and that was very clear and it also meant that they didn't need to tie themselves into family structures that had been oppressive for them. So they could live on their own, they didn't need, they could get rid of their husbands. And they all talked about that as being a really important um, <coughs> turning point. And actually linking into this um, question of how important income is in terms of ending violence, <coughs> it's not clear cut. It's not clear cut. <coughs> earning, a woman earning an income doesn't magically build her resistance or make her see violence as not not normal, but what it does do is promotes a level of self-confidence and that is really critical in the journey to challenging um, social norms around violence. But so too, the existence, again at local level, of people like uh, Manuka here who runs an organisation uh, called Ratcha Nepal in Tamil, in where most of the informal entertainment sector um, is. And she herself worked in the sector and she, but she set up now her own organisation and trade union to really support the women um, around her. And in, in Violence Against Women research, this term that's really emerged is positive deviancy. So positive is wild about positive deviancy at the moment because people like Manuka represent positive deviance. So they have stood up and said, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. Digging into what, what, what moulds these leaders, it's difficult to say, but they clearly all have very courageous um, attributes. And they also often talk about moments in which they just realise that they weren't going to put up with, um, with the status quo anymore. So Manuka works to uh, enforce and encourage very close peer networks amongst the women in the informal sector. Um, in Tamil and also sets up trade unions and offers training and saving schemes and so on. And actually there's a whole string of, of organisations in Kathmandu who are run by similarly impressive um, individuals. So that's the tale, the whistle stop tale of um, snippet of the situation in um, Nepal. I want to now um, shift you on to FGM. So a project that I'm working on in Sudan is really part of, and working as part of DFID's big pilot intervention program around ending um, FGM. A lot of resource has gone into Sudan to really try and end, well the deadline was 2018, so we haven't got many months left. That deadline is not going to be met, unfortunately. Um, but part of what I'm doing is working with two brilliant PhD students who are here, actually some of you will have um, met them, Saha and Nurha. And they're working to really try and understand processes of, of change in relation to FGM. Um, conducting field work in outer Khartoum in a very mixed um, community that's made up of some families that have never cut and families that have always cut. Now, Sudan was chosen because the prevalence rate in Sudan is nine, the average is 90%. 90% of women are cut and cut to the most extreme form which is type um, 3. So you can see why Sudan was, um, was chosen. But, I mean, the 90% the it differs. So some regions, and I said they don't cut, people don't cut at all, and others it's even higher um, than that. So why does FGM happen? Well, we know it happens because it's built into, again, this gendered system in which women are um, commodified at the point of marriage. So you have to, as a family, offer up a pure woman. You need to prove that she is untouched. Other cultural practices such as bride price then intersect. So a family for presenting a bride as pure can fetch a higher um, price. So there's an economic factor. 
But most strongly than anything, it's a cultural dimension we can see in Sudan. It's about what it is to be a woman. It's about pride and honour, protecting your pride and your honour in your identity and that of your um, family. And what we can see in research is challenging that is really, really difficult. And I'm going to show you this, that um, my colleague Nafisa, brilliant professor, Ms. Nafisa, Afad University, in Khartoum, um, she drew this for me to try and explain the complexity of all of the different intervention programs. I'd need two hours to unpack it. But you can see that there were just multiple um, UN-funded, some UN-funded um, programs. There's the DFID program, the DFID, DFID is working with different UN agencies, going down into various strategies, different states, different parts of the country. Um, with, in terms of outputs, wanting to understand the social norms behind FGM, generating evidence, mobilising communities to abandon the practice. Is that all coordinated? No. Which is part of the, that's, you know, in itself part of the problem. But what my PhD students are finding, interestingly, is that some of the shame is at the heart of it all. So on the one hand, if you are not cut, that seemed to be shameful. In Sudan, the primary route to trying to end FGM is through different social movements. So there's about two or three different social movements now in Sudan. One, the most well-known in Sudan, is Salima, which is about presenting this picture of a, a woman as being whole and uncut, and that being, that being positive. Um, but messaging that comes through those social um, media campaigning, social community mobilisation, is almost the reverse, saying, so the argument being that, well, to be cut is shameful. That's, the message is being heard in that way. So you can, women are still stuck in the middle. You, you know, if you're cut, you're shameful. If you're uncut, you're shamed. So that's not a particular, particularly helpful situation to be in, but we don't at the moment have anything else. But it's understanding that there is this process in which shame is going to work itself through in different ways and being ready to... Um, respond to that. We can also see in the research that, that we've done um, that families, the health, a lot of it again, the health messaging that it's, you know, that it's essentially is going to leave women with serious problems for the rest of their lives on health grounds. So we see um, families saying, okay, well that's because we're cutting to type 3, so what we're going to do now is we'll just do type 1, as if type 1 is somehow okay. But it's, it's obviously not okay, it's still violence and it's still abuse, but it makes it really difficult for us to measure change. Because if you ask a family that shifted from type 3 to type 1, they'll say we don't practice anymore. Because they don't see type 1 as actually being what all of the campaigning um, is about. Also, again, applying that web um, diagram, thinking about the polit political economy in Sudan. Um, Midwives, state midwives, don't get paid, rarely get paid. The health system is, has just disintegrated. How do midwives make a living in Sudan? They cut girls. And actually, again, there's a, a certain honour attached to that um, position that's also a motivation, so it's not just the money. Your family will honour you because you were the person that came and cut, um, cut their daughters. So there's that side of it. We're also seeing in... Sudan growth in the private uh, medical sector and cosmetic surgery, offering FGM under the banner of cosmetic surgery. So different kind of laser treatments are now being um, offered to, to provide a more beautiful looking cut. So we see that industry growing also because largely, um, perhaps because of the globalisation of concepts of beauty, but probably even more just because doctors are not being paid. So in understanding why something like FGM continues, we've got to place it in that, that unfortunately complex um, context, and we have to respond to it through all of those different um, levels. So that's FGM in Sudan. So now we are going to move back to um, Rural Rajasthan and to my um, PhD research. So, in my 